Well, good morning. Welcome to everybody on site and those who are joining us online this morning. Uh, how are we doing today? Are we, yes? Yeah, yeah. okay, there we go. <laughs> I wasn't sure. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, it's good to have you all with us here today. This is the third week in our marriage series where we are talking about God's plan for marriage based upon uh, the verse in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, where, where there we see that God talks about in his plan is that for a husband and wife to leave, weave, and cleave. Been with us for the last few weeks. You know that the first week we started talking about leaving about this need to reorganize priorities from the past in order to make space for the new kind of primary uh, loyalty that we have in the present, being our, our spouse that we have. And of course, God permeates all of that, all of our relationships, and so it definitely is present in there as well. But in terms of our human relationships, we make space for our new primary relationship in marriage. And in that space that we create, we build trust. Then last week, you're with us, we know that we talked about how we fill that space in which we're building trust. We, we fill that by weaving our lives together into a shared story through good communication. And we looked at that, we started last week by looking back to sort of the original story, the, the original event that led to this key verse being given. And that was when, when Adam was alone in the Garden of Eden. And God determined that it was not good. For the first time ever, he said something was not good. It was not good for man to be alone. So he created a suitable partner. He created woman. And there we have Adam and Eve. And Adam, when he first sees Eve, he says, this is flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. Meaning that she is not lesser than him or built some, something that was imperfect from out of him. But she is built of the same stuff. And because they're of the same stuff, they then can weave their lives together. They can weave physically, relationally, spiritually, weave their lives together. That's kind of what we got up to last week. I want to go back to that story a bit today because that's not the end of the story, right? If we keep reading in Genesis chapter 2, and you'll, you'll find some of the notes and the verses on this in the sermon notes in the pew portal. Uh, if you want to look those up, feel free to go ahead and do so. Because if we keep reading through Genesis chapter 2 to the end, we jump into into the near the end of that chapter, we find that Adam and Eve, I, I imagine they must have been like, like totally stoked to be, to be together. Like love at first sight. This amazing experience. Love at first sight. And they, as they grow together, I imagine Adam looked into Eve's eyes one night and said, I will always love you. I'll always honor you. I'll always protect you. Those typical wedding vows that we say to each other. And from that point on, they did everything together, didn't they? I imagine that they would hold hands walking through the garden together on these nice dates. And they, and they would talk with God together. And they'd, they'd have picnics together in fields. And they would lay down and look at the clouds and the animals out of them and all these things that they do. And then one day, one day they went on a date and they found a U-pick on the way. And like in the Okanagan, when you go pick peaches off the trees, you go pick your own fruit. They, they found a you pick on one particular date, and you kind of know the rest of the story, right? How, how in that in that you pick, Satan was there and tempted Eve, and she she picked the fruit that she wasn't supposed to, the forbidden fruit, and then she took a bite and she gave some to Adam, who who was standing right there, said nothing the whole time, and she offers some to him, and sure enough, he eats it as well. And that's where the story changes in Genesis chapter 3. Uh, this is where the story changes. It goes from this, this amazing love story of, of the first two people coming together and, and doing everything together, making these vows and weaving their lives together. Something changes all of a sudden because it says in Genesis chapter 3 verse 7 that after they ate of this fruit that their eyes were opened and that they, their innocence was essentially lost. And they realized that they were naked and so they clothed themselves, they covered themselves and they hid and then along comes God, who had walked with them and talked with them in the garden. Along comes God, fully aware of all this has happened because, well, he, he's God. But also because when he sees them, for the first time, they're hiding. And when they come out of hiding, they have clothes on. So obviously something has gone down. And God says this to Adam in verse 11. Have you eaten from the tree that I have commanded you not to eat from? And as Adam's sin becomes known... I have to imagine he paused for a second, probably looked at God, and then looked at his wife, and then looked at God, and looked at his wife, and as he looked at, at, into the precious face of his wife as Eve, and he thought about those words, I'll always love, I'll, I'll always honor, I'll always protect her. And then in verse 12, he goes, she did it. 
It was her. It was her. She was tempted. She's the one who gave me the fruit, and then I ate it. Completely throws her under the bus. Completely throws her under the bus in this moment. And I guarantee you that in that moment, Eve was the very first wife for the very first time to give Adam the look. Right? Like, <laughs> that look. We all know the look. Right, guys? <laughs> very first time in history it probably happened. And then as this story finishes, God declares his judgment upon the sin that they've committed. He casts them out of the garden. And as they quietly packed up their fig leaves and then walked out of the garden with their heads down. It probably wasn't too long until they got outside. And this isn't in the Bible, but I think it's safe to assume they got outside. It wasn't too long until Eve stopped and looked at Adam and said, what did you say about me? And thus began the very first argument that we find. Adam, does this goat skin make me look big? Looks better on you than the previous owner. What? I'm having a hard time losing these last few pounds since bearing your children, and that's the best you can do? I look better than a goat? Thanks. Babe, you know you are the most beautiful woman on the planet. Mm. What? I'm the only woman on the planet. Well, I can't help that. You know, and it's amazing that as the only woman on the planet, you still can't seem to remember my birthday or give me flowers once in a while. Well, I did give you a rib. Oh, right. I forgot about that, since you haven't mentioned it for an hour. It's like your free pass to never lift a finger for me again. Never lift a finger? I am out there busting my rear all day. Food just doesn't pop up from the ground. I have to get it with the sweat of my brow, since someone went and got the ground cursed. You think farming's hard? Try raising those kids. Try giving birth. Well, if someone wouldn't have taken advice from a talking reptile. Oh, here we go. Are you talking to me, you little snake? What? Oh, jump off a bridge? Oh, I would, but they haven't been invented yet. Oh, eat this fruit? Well, you look like a pretty trustworthy snake. Nobody's perfect. Yeah, well, we were until you went and pretty much ruined it for all of mankind, so good job with that. I seem to remember you taking a bite, too. Well, I thought I was eating from the tree of the knowledge of restfulness and serenity. Right. It's never your fault. Besides, what was I going to do with a fallen wife? That would just be weird. Oh, you fell for me? You're an idiot. Idiot? I named every single animal. Right. Great job with that. A, a prairie dog's not a dog, a seahorse isn't a horse, and a bald eagle isn't bald. Well, I was going pretty fast. Aardvark? Platypus? Okay, they were at the back of the line. Not everything can be cat or rat or bat. Hippopotamus? Yeah, well, woman was taken. Okay, how many gorge do you have back there? That was a joke. Not good for men to be alone. <laughs> no, it's great. Last week we talked about good communication, right? <laughs> this week we're going to talk about something else. Last week we talked about how good communication can, can weave our stories together, can help us to build intimacy. And if we take that to the next step, it, it stands to reason, doesn't it, that, that bad talk or, or bad communication, a.k.a. conflict, would cause whatever we've woven to come unraveled, wouldn't it? Because we've all experienced this. We've all experienced conflict. It's not a matter of if you're going to have conflict in your relationships. It's just really a matter of when and, and why. You know, when Nadine and I ran this uh, marriage enrichment course a couple years ago, we, uh, we talked about this a little bit. We assessed why. Like, why do people have conflict? And some of the top reasons that came up, maybe you can relate to some of these, were, were things like, like money, uh, priorities, family, uh, sleeping habits came up a lot, interestingly. Some of these things that people tend to have a high level of conflict over. Perhaps you can relate to some of those. And if you want to learn more about that or, or dive into some of that a bit, you know, sign up for our marriage enrichment course starting on April 12th. But then we add to this, not only the inevitability of conflict, we add to this that we each have our own different level of comfort and ability to navigate conflict based upon our personalities and our history from our backgrounds. Uh, whether we fear conflict or if we are, you know, more had a, kind of a good model for us on how to navigate conflict. Uh, for example, perhaps if you came from a family where your parents fought all the time, you might avoid conflict. 
Or if you come from a relationship where, where your parents hid every little bit of conflict they had, you might think that conflict is actually a terrible, awful, bad thing. And, and based upon these things, you'll either kind of turtle or you will stand your ground stubbornly when you face conflict. You may get a little sweaty. I'm even saying the word conflict. Your palms are sweating a little bit about that. Or you might be like, yeah, conflict, water off duck's back. No big deal. We can handle this. See, all of these things will shape your view of it, but also it will shape your ability to navigate it. You know, for me, for example, I grew up with this understanding that, and, and wherever it came from, I had this understanding that a good marriage was going to be 100% conflict-free. That that was one of the measurements of if you have a good godly marriage, 100% conflict-free. And that got tested one day when I went over to one of my pastor's houses. See, it was when I was younger, and I, I used to uh, play the saxophone. I would give saxophone lessons, and he decided he wanted to learn. So I went over to his house to give him a lesson. And as I walked up to his front step, I was about to knock on the door, and I heard it. Him and his wife, just cats and dogs, like going at it inside, just yelling, yelling. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I have discovered like the secret dysfunctional life of one of our pastors <laughs> that they have. And so I started to slowly back away. I'm like, I'm just going to pretend this doesn't exist. But they saw me through the window, and he came running down. He opened the door, and he's like, hey, hey, Mark. And, and I think he saw the bewildered look on my face. Because he goes, did, did, you, did you hear us arguing? I was like, yeah. <laughs> I think everyone heard you guys arguing. <laughs> and he's just sorry about that. And he could see how troubled I was. But then he says... You, you understand that, that husbands and wives fight sometimes, right? You understand this, don't you? And, and I didn't really have an answer because I really didn't. And that was my first exposure as he sat down and talked to me for a while about the fact that conflict is not necessarily bad. And this might be news to a lot of us, that conflict is not necessarily bad. Bad conflict is bad. But good conflict actually can still weave our lives together. And that's what I want to talk about today, is that there's an ability for conflict actually to further weave our lives together. Uh, maybe you've heard of doctors Les and Leslie Parrott, and, and they say it this way. They say that, that conflict is the price we pay for a deeper level of intimacy at times. You see, we're talking about the story that we're weaving together through communication, right? We're weaving our stories together. Not every chapter in that story is a romance, not every chapter in that story is a comedy. Some of them are a little more dramatic. Some of them are a little more of an action movie. Some of them are a little bit more a thriller that take place. Some of these chapters are not all romance and comedy. And when we come to realize that, we can understand that that exists, and we can choose when we see those chapters to skip over them and just avoid them because they tarnish the whole narrative if we include them. Or we can choose to see them as opportunities to allow ourselves to be genuine and to be feeling like we are heard, to feel like we are respected because our opinion and our emotions matter. We can see them as opportunities to work through something together so that we can resolve our stuff together. Now, I'm not going to try and convince you today that conflict is enjoyable. That would be like trying to convince you that a root canal is fun. That, that, that's not my objective here by any means. But I do want to hopefully show you from the Word of God that good conflict does have a purpose. And it is possible to actually experience good conflict and then to see it as the price that we sometimes pay for a deeper level of intimacy in our most important relationships. Now, some of you might be a little skeptical that this is even possible, because the, the only conflict that perhaps you've experienced is negative. And, and I want to share with you another quote that we're going to break down a little bit here as we go through this a bit. Another quote by a guy named Carl Jung, who said this, a very famous quote. He said this. He said, conflict is like fire. It, it has two aspects, that of burning and that of shedding light. In this wonderful quote, he, he presents two different ways of viewing conflict. And quite often, this is applied to marriage. It'll show up at marriage conferences quite often. If you spend enough time on a marriage website, you'll probably come across a quote like this or very similar to it. And what he's basically saying here is, what, what does fire do? Well, we, we know that when fire burns, that it consumes. It, it tends to destroy. And, and if you touch it, it hurts. And so when we experience fire in that fashion, we want to avoid it because of the damage that it does. But we also know that fire, when it's controlled, for let's say, for example, in a fireplace, what does it do? It brings light to a room. 
It actually reveals things within a room. A fire in a fireplace brings warmth. And it can actually draw two people closer together. You see, conflict in this sense has an illuminating power where it allows us to see the barriers and the challenges that may exist within the room between two people. And once we can see the barriers and the challenges, we then have an opportunity to try to overcome them, to to try to snuff out the parts that would burn, and we do it together. Building upon our talk last week about communication, about how the words we use make a difference, we see that applying here as well. Because some of the words we use in conflict may burn, but some of the words we use may also shed light. Proverbs 15.1 talks about this, where it says, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. A harsh word stirs the fire. It stirs it up. We know what this is like, don't we? We've all had harsh words spoken against us from somebody at some point. And those that we're closest to, they tend to, they tend to burn the most, don't they? And when those happen, we can feel insulted. We, we can start to feel a little bit angry. And I hope I'm not the only one, but sometimes when I feel insulted and angry, I will have this tendency to respond in kind. Not respond kindly, but respond in kind. Meaning, if you hurt me, I want to defend myself, but more than defend myself, I want to fire back. And it sounds mean when we hear it being said, but isn't it true that sometimes when somebody hurts us, we want to hurt them right back? And this is where we get kind of that saying, we fight fire with fire. Keep with the analogy here. That, that, that keep fire with fire is a saying that comes from the 19th century, where in order to guard settlements from grass and forest fires, uh, communities will go out and they would light these things called backfires. It's still a strategy that's used today to, to light a fire that burns up all of, the, uh, all of the potential fuel for the main fire. And kind of like a fire line type of idea. And it works effectively today because we have good <laughs> tools in place to control those fires. But in, when this fur- furries first came out, they didn't have those controls. So what they would do is they'd have a main fire that they're afraid of. They would go light these backfires, but they lacked the ability to control the backfires. And one fire became many fire, and it just got out of control. Got out of hand. You ever feel like that? Like an argument starts, and somebody reacts to the argument And then you add fuel to the fire because one fire turned into many fires just all over the place. Anyone ever experienced that? It's quite common. But but there's another option here in this proverb. It says, a gentle answer offers two completely different outcomes. One outcome it offers is the potential to not escalate the the issue that's already taking place. But, But the other outcome that's possible is to even extinguish it. To even extinguish it. You see, rather than trying to put out fires by lighting more fires, a gentle word lowers the temperature. Instead of attacking, a gentle word seeks to listen. Instead of adding fuel to the fire, a gentle word kind of removes fuel from the fire. Instead of burning, a gentle word actually can help us to use conflict to reveal. To reveal what's taking place within a relationship, within a, within a moment in a person's life. And one of the ways that we can do this is found in a very familiar verse in James chapter 1, verse 19, where it says, Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. We've probably all read that verse before or had that quoted to us somewhere. Yeah, it's a very common verse. This is one of the ways that we can avoid the harsh words and, and gravitate more towards the gentle answer. But I want you to notice something in this verse, and actually in in both of these verses. At no point is there a condemnation against ever getting angry. See, we don't want to start with the understanding, with the premise that that anger in and of itself is wrong and sinful. Here it talks about what anger leads to. It it talks about what anger does to us. Those are the things that cause damage. Those are the things we need to be careful of. And therefore, we never want to allow anger to get out of control is the message that we find in all these passages. You see, the instruction here is that that when you find yourself in a moment of conflict, when you're not feeling heard, when when you're maybe not getting your way, when you're starting, and we all know we do this, when we start to form our rebuttal before the other person's even finished talking, because we got to shoot from the hip, because they got their words in and they stung, and so i got to get my words loaded into the chamber so that, boy, I can fire right back. 
But instead, it's saying, no, 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 slow down. Don't react, respond. Don't react, respond. Don't let anger gain control. And that's so critical. You know what the difference is between an argument that drives a wedge between people and a conversation that weaves? You know what the difference comes down to? How we control our emotions. If you think about it, you can have a conversation or you can have an argument about the very same thing. One will lead to a destructive conclusion and one can actually lead to a constructive resolution. And so often the difference between those two is our ability to control the emotion because the emotion drives the words that are used in each of those conversations. Isn't that true? To control the emotion that happens. So how do we do this? When emotions are high, you know, conflict, they go hand in hand, right? When emotions are high, how can we possibly be quick to listen, and slow to speak, and slow to get angry? Well, let me ask you this question. If you're watching sports and the emotions on the ice or on the field get high, like if a team has gotten scored on five times in the last three minutes, or if you're down by one with 45 seconds to go and there's emotion involved, there's, there's, there's tension, there's maybe some anger, there's maybe some frustration, all these emotions are stewing. What do, they, what do teams do? They call a timeout. They do. Thank you. They call a timeout. Why? Because they got to pause the game. Because they want to prepare to respond instead of reacting out of the emotion. The whole purpose of the timeout is to prepare to respond as opposed to reacting. And I want to suggest to you that we can do the exact same thing in marriage. Is that we can do the exact same thing when emotions get raised up. We can call a timeout. So let me explain to you and what I mean by this and give you the five R's to calling a timeout in these moments. I'm going to do this fairly quickly because, um, because we're going to talk about the enrichment, marriage enrichment a little bit, but also they're fairly straightforward, I think. And so here's the five R's. Here's what it looks like to call a timeout. Number one is to recognize the need for a timeout. It's on the next slide there. See it up there. You can go to the next slide. We see the need to, oh, sorry, you got, my eyes were going, not yours. Uh, explain the need for these. So one is to recognize the need for it. What does that mean? It means if, if somebody's face is red, if, if their breathing is elevated, if there's tears that are coming down their face, if the conversation has turned to accusations or to belittling or if the volume of the voice has increased, if you reach a point where you have emotionally checked out going, whatever you want, that's whatever. That's recognizing the need for a timeout. Somebody needs to make the request for a timeout. Now here's, here's the most critical thing to this whole thing. When we call a timeout, we are calling a timeout on ourselves. I dare you to try and call a timeout on your spouse. <laughs> I dare you to be like, honey, you're getting a little heated. I think you need a timeout. See how that works for you when it works. <laughs> That's, no, we're calling a timeout on ourselves, saying, I need, whew, I'm getting elevated. I need to step back for a minute, is what we're talking about here. Okay, don't call a timeout on your spouse. That's, like, that's, that's lighting fires, right? We don't do that. On ourselves. Honey, I need to step back, and I need to collect myself. That's what we can do. And during that time, we relax, and we calm down. We do something for ourselves. You go off on your own. You do something by yourself. Maybe you go for a walk. Maybe you read a book. Maybe you play some video games or watch some TV. Uh, I remember one couple that, that Nadine and I counseled when, when she would get heated and call a timeout and go do something. She would go clean. I was like, dude, you can't make her angry all the time just because the house is messy. Like you, like you can't use that as your tactic to get the house clean. <laughs> but that was her thing. She would go clean things. But the whole point was you got to get away, do something relaxing, calm down. And while you're doing that, remember what's important. Remember, why is this topic so difficult for me? Why was I so angry? Try and understand the other person's point of view during this time as well. Where were they coming from? Like, what were they feeling? What were they experiencing? And remind yourself that we are a team, and the only way to win is to win as a team. And once we've had enough time to reach those points, we can then get to number five, which is to resume the conversation, remembering that God gave us two ears and one mouth, which means we need to be quick to listen, 
and slow to speak. We need to be striving for understanding as a, and res, re, resolution as opposed to defending and attacking. Does this make sense? Does this make sense? It's one of the ways we can actually put James 1.19 into practice effectively and find ourselves answering with gentle answers that seek to resolve and understand and weave through conflict as opposed to being burnt and dividing through conflict. And if you can put things like this into practice in your relationship, if, you, if we can put these into practice in your most important relationship, we can actually find that good conflict is sometimes the price we pay for deeper intimacy. Now, if we're honest, probably the most common strategy, though, is not this, right? <laughs> probably the most common strategy is we just either, either two people go at it or another very common one is avoidance. Just avoid it all together. Just don't even go there. But sometimes that is another way of saying, if we're going to avoid conflict, I'm going to have to walk on eggshells my whole life. That's not living, enjoying freedom. Sometimes when we say we're going to avoid it, we're saying, well, we have to just, you know, things might blow up a bit, but we just don't talk about it for a while. We wait for things to simmer down, and then we just, we just move on. We, we, we just move on. And many couples are satisfied with that. Many couples are satisfied with saying, hey, we're just gonna, we're just gonna get along. We're just gonna try to enjoy each other's company. And we're gonna try and avoid anything that could possibly upset the other person. And while living that way resembles kind of leaving and weaving, it sets the bar really, really low. It, it might look like that's a fulfilling marriage, and it seems to work to a point. But it sets the bar really, really low. It reminds me of an exasperated college student who simply goes, well, C's get degrees. A C is good enough for me. And it's true, but even in that statement, doesn't it acknowledge that there's so much more available? If you're just settling for a C-level relationship, yeah, you'll probably get by and it's going to be functional to a degree, but there's so much more available to you. There's so much more that can be out there. And in marriage, what often keeps us from experiencing, you know, a higher level of unity is unresolved conflict. And there's a, a famous passage that, again, another passage people are probably very, very familiar with because these are things that we wrestle with. And so these passages commonly come to mind for us. A familiar passage that speaks about this. And it, it, we find it in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 or 27, where, where Paul says this. He says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Have you ever heard this before? Everyone ever been in an argument and someone was like, hey, don't let the sun go, don't, don't let the sun go down. You gotta stay up all night and talk about that till you get that thing worked out. Everyone ever stay up all night <laughs> and work on these things? You know, I, I believe the same principle that I apply to board meetings applies to marriage, and that's this. No good decisions are made after 10 o'clock at all. I would rather we take a time out and go get some good night's sleep and then resume the conversation than stay up and just keep punching through it as we get more and more frustrated and more and more tired. But that's not what this verse is about. See, what this verse is about, it's not about staying up all night. It's a proverbial saying about not leaving things unresolved. That's what this verse is talking about. And when it talks here proverbially about, about the sun setting on an issue and then the new day dawning with its own challenges and its own concerns and the old stuff just getting swept under the rug. That's what it's talking about. But do not let the sun set on the issues and just sweep them under the rug. You know why? Because they don't go away. They just tend to pile up. They tend to pile up, and all of a sudden we have these little piles of unresolved conflict under the rug of the home in which we live. And you're walking along one day just fine, and they turn into landmines. And then you step on one, and boom, it just blows up again. We haven't talked about that for six months. Where'd that come from? It's because of an unresolved issue that got swept under the rug, and it turned into a danger spot. And if you find yourself in a relationship where you are having big fights over little things, or if you are having the same reoccurring fight over and over and over again, this is the issue. 
okay? Nine times out of ten, if you're having big fights over little things or if you're having reoccurring fights, it's because you have unresolved issues. And quite often, the big fight over those little things aren't even about those little things. It's about this thing over here. And if you're having reoccurring fights, it's probably about this thing over here that we never actually get close enough to to deal with. And we can see from that analogy, from that example, that description, we can see, can't we, how that can lead to a relationship becoming unraveled instead of weaving. Can we see that? And as dangerous as it is, Paul says it's even worse than that. Paul says it's even worse than just having a relationship unravel. He, he speaks here about this opening us up to temptation, for, to open us up from attack from Satan that leads to sin through this. Well, how does that work? Well, let me ask you this. Play back to maybe a moment in your own life when you experienced that, when, when you were in the middle of a conflict with somebody. And when, say it was your spouse, for example, and when you're angry at your spouse, when you feel disrespected, when, when you feel rejected, when, when you feel unloved, have you ever had a thought come into your mind that goes, you need to do something that makes you feel better. You need to just go do your own thing. You need to go do whatever you want. You should go do this thing over here that you've been avoiding for a while because you deserve it. It'll make you feel better. You ever have those thoughts when they're in the middle of a heated time, when they're feeling unloved, when they're feeling rejected, when they're feeling like, like they're wounded? And then these thoughts come in going, you deserve this. You should just go do this because it will make you feel better. And if you take the bait of that thought, in that moment, do you really care what your spouse thinks? Do you really care if your spouse gets upset? Would it be safe to say that even sometimes you're like, oh, I'm just going to go do it in spite of how they might respond to that? We wouldn't say those things to our partner necessarily, but isn't that how our thought processes go sometimes? This, this is the danger. This is the temptation of unresolved conflict. You know, years ago, uh, I think there's one example from many, many years ago when Nadine and I had a big fight. And, and sometimes when we fight, it goes like, it's like a, it's like a, it goes through rounds. It's like round one, and then ding, ding, go to your corners, right? And so, anyways, the bell went off. I went to my corner. She went to hers. My corner was I went and had a nap. Her corner was she went out, and she ended up going shopping. I woke up a while later with her showing me what she bought. She had gone out and bought herself a puppy. <laughs> and she showed me the puppy. And we had talked about this, though. I was like, I don't want a puppy, and she was like, I don't care if we talked about it. I don't care what you think about it. It makes me feel better <laughs> that I now have a puppy. <laughs> and I was thinking, well, thank God it wasn't a cat. It was, was all I could think. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> so, but she went and did this. But, but you know, it, it's a simple example, but, but there's more serious ones that happen too. It, we do not want to allow anger to gain control of our decisions or to gain anger of our thought processes. We do not want to allow unresolved conflict to drive those things. Because not only will they drive a wedge between you, but they will open you up to temptation. They will open you up to sin. And in my time as a pastor, I have come across people who have done way worse things than buying puppies. In the middle of their sin, they, they bought cats. I know, it's awful. No, in their, in their time of conflict, in their time of not feeling loved, in their time of unresolved conflict, they've gone out and sinned from sins that they cannot recover from. I, there, there are people that I've, I've walked with for a while who, who they look back and they go, I, I wish I had controlled my anger because it got abusive. People who said, I wish I had controlled my thought process because it led me to have an affair whether that be uh, relational, physical, online. I I wish I had controlled these things a little better because it led to addictions of everything from substances to to gambling. I, I remember working with one couple, and whenever they got in a fight, he would go to the casino, and he would literally take the mortgage payment and put it on 12. How do you go home after that? But these are the temptations. These are the sins that come in. When we're not feeling love and we're not feeling respected, when conflict goes unresolved and that's the direction that it leads us. Sometimes there's sins that we can't recover from. So what do we do? Well, one strategy that Nadine and I use is we created something called a prayer board. Which was simply a whiteboard that we had put the scripture Philippians 4-6 on. 
which says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and by petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to the Lord. And we would write prayer prayer requests on the board. But we would also sometimes write issues that we were conflicted about on the board. Which remind us, one, to approach those through prayer. But at the same time, whenever we would start to deal with something and we didn't quite get it finished or... Or if it got a little heated, or if we just weren't even ready to get into those waters yet, we would write it on the board. And it became a record of this thing that is unresolved. It became a reminder there's something unresolved between us. And you weren't allowed to erase it until both of us agreed that it was resolved. Now, if you're to do something like this, you want to be careful where you hang this in your house. (laughs) You don't want to hang it in your kitchen. It makes for awkward dinner parties as, as your friends and family discuss like your stuff around dinner. So no, we, we hung ours in uh, our bedroom near our closet because it was our room. So people who shouldn't see it wouldn't see it. It was near our closet because then we would see it every single day. And every day at least once be reminded, all right, still got to talk about that. Still got to resolve that. Now, you might have a more modern or tech-savvy way to do this. It's, it's simply just a tool. It's a tool to not allow the sun to go down on issues that are unresolved. It's a tool to allow you to work together to find resolutions and not allow things to turn into landmines that hurt each other. It, it's a tool that reminds you that not only are we weaving our stories together and that we have to resolve this, we have to work through this, we have to find a way to, to overcome this together, but in prayer, we need God. To come weave that with us as well. You know, part of the story that we're weaving together in our lives is going to include conflict. It's just an inevitability. It's going to include conflict. You know, and and whether it's something that comes up out of nowhere or something that's been around for a while that needs more attention, sometimes that's the price we need to pay for deeper intimacy in our relationships. But with God's help, we do not have to live in conflict, we can live in love. And we can live in freedom. Now, I know for many people that this is a, a tough topic. It's, it's a sensitive issue for, for many people. And in some cases today, I may be touching on an issue from your past or from your present home that's a little sensitive. And I haven't tried today to offer you any quick fixes. I, I simply want to give you some tools and give you some insight from, from the Word of God as well on how we can press into these things. And I can tell you this, it, it will take time. It will require both people to adopt a degree of vulnerability and a desire, a steadfast desire to work through it together. If you need help with that, uh, let, let us know in the office. That's part of what we're here to do is to help strengthen relationships within the body and within the community. So let us know if we can help you with that. But while I can't offer you a quick fix to all of these things, I can offer you this. I can offer you this, that the first step is to ensure that you are weaving Jesus into your life. That would be the first step if we want to have success in these areas that maybe are going unresolved or maybe we're having unresolved conflict, is to weave Jesus into your life. If you have a a personal relationship with Christ, be in the word, be in prayer regarding whatever is on your heart and your mind, and be open to hearing what the Holy Spirit has to say to you. Because more Jesus in you may be the very thing that your marriage needs in order to heal and to grow. It's more Jesus in you. And if you don't have that relationship with Christ, if you have not allowed Christ to come into your life and to set you free from those sins and to, and to guide you in your walk, I just want to remind you that just like with Adam and Eve, we all have sinned, and because of that, we have all been separated from God. We're not able to weave because of God's holiness and purity. He cannot weave with us because it would tarnish his perfection and his holiness. But he promised then, right then and there, when he went in that moment in the garden, he promised right then and there that one day he would send one who would crush the head of Satan and who would take our sin upon himself. And that one was Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, who we remember and we celebrate his victory at Easter in just a few weeks. The one who came, lived, ministered, set the example, but ultimately offered his life in our place, defeating sin, defeating death, in raising to victory. 
And scripture tells us that anybody who believes in him, anybody who will make space for him to be in that first place and to grow in trust in their lives with him. Anyone who will do that is saved from their sin. They are set free from the judgment and the penalty of that sin. They're saved from the separation from God. And instead they are woven into the family of God and given new life. With a new hope, with a new destiny, with the presence of God to walk with them and to guide them. And so wherever you may be in this issue of conflict within your relationships, the number one step we can look at is to weave Jesus into our lives. If you already know him, press into him. If you do not know him, say yes to him today. And praise God that he did not avoid conflict with us. But in his grace, truth, and love, he resolved it for us. To him be the glory.